Operation Epsom, sometimes referred to as the First Battle of the Odon, is mostly known for the drive towards the Odon bridges and the initial fighting for the all-important Hill 112 near Baron and Esquet in the attempt to outflank the German-held city of Caen during the Normandy campaign. In this video we will take a look at the battle that developed at Saint-Montvieux on the extreme left flank of Operation Epsom during the first day of the offensive. Caen had been one of the most important objectives of the Normandy landings. However, staunch German resistance in front of the historic city, as well as a congested beach, had prevented the British 3rd Infantry Division from capturing Caen on June 6. Further attacks over the course of the following days also led to little progress, and attempts to keep the battle moving at Tilly sur seul west of the city also turned into a deadlock. By mid-June, the British-Canadian front had ground to a halt. Further attacks were planned for mid to late June, but the weather turned and a violent storm struck the Mulberry harbours, which were paramount to the logistics of the Normandy campaign. The time lost due to the storms delayed the landings of the newly arrived 8th Corps, which was earmarked to launch the new attack to encircle Caen from the southwest. In the meantime, the delays offered the Germans valuable time to reorganise and strengthen their defences. The 15th Scottish Division was to launch Operation Epsom. The first phase of the operation would see the capture of Saint-Montvieux and Chieux. The second phase consisted of the drive towards the Odon River itself and entailed the capture of several crossings to start building a bridgehead. The Scotsmen were tasked with the capture of Mouan and Grainville. In the event that little resistance was met, the 11th Armoured Division was to push through in a sharp action and race towards the bridges. The 43rd Wessex Division was to hold firm bases at the successful termination of each phase to allow the 15th Scottish Division to reorganise and expand the bridgeheads towards the Orne River to continue encircling Caen from the southwest. Originally, the offensive was to start on 22 June 1944. However, this had to be postponed to the 26th of June to allow the logistical chain to catch up from the rupture caused by the storm. One day prior to Epsom, the 49th West Riding Division launched Operation Martlet to drive a wedge in between the Panzerlehr and the 12th SS Hitler Jugend divisions and to capture the important high ground at fontenelle penel and Rohre, which overlooked the terrain over which the 15th Scottish Division was to advance the following morning. Fontenay proved well defended and the men of the West Riding advanced around the village to capture Tessel Wood, where further violent battles erupted. As night fell, Rohrer was still firmly in German hands as the 15th Scottish Division moved into their jump-off locations. The 44th Lowland Brigade of the 15th Scottish Division had been given the task of capturing Saint-Montvieux. Brigadier Money committed two battalions to lead the assault and deployed the 8th Royal Scots on the right and Lieutenant Colonel Buchanan's 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers on the left. Both attacking battalions deployed in a similar formation, with A Company on the right and B Company on the left, followed by Companies C and D. In order to secure their objective, Churchill tanks of the 9th Battalion, Royal Tank Regiment, accompanied the attacking Scotsmen. Also, the flame-throwing Churchill tanks of 4 and 5 Troop, under the command of Captain Strachan of the 141st Regiment Royal Armoured Corps, had been put at the disposal of the brigade. The brigade's 3rd Battalion, the 6th King's Own Scottish Borders, was kept in reserve. It was up to the 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers to capture Saint-Montvieux, while the 8th Royal Scots would capture their objective, namely the hamlet of La Gaule. Joining the 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers were Major Stewart and Sergeant Connolly of No. 5 Army Film and Photo Section. Many of the shots taken by them will be covered in this video as it provides an authentic account of the battle that developed at Saint-Montvieux. It shows the high grass and tall corn through which the Scots Fusiliers attacked, as well as the thick mist and terrain the Churchill tanks had to manoeuvre through. Opposing the 44th Lowland Brigade were the men of SS Sturmbahnführer Bernhard Krause's 1st Battalion, SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 26. Krause had deployed his 1st and 3rd companies on the right, with the 2nd on the left supported by the 4th Company. Opposing the right flank of the 44th Brigade was the 2nd Company of the 12th SS Pioneer Battalion. At 7.30am, the attack commenced. The 44th Brigade left their forming up positions under the cover of a heavy artillery barrage. Lieutenant Robert Wilcombe of the 6th King's Own Scottish Borderers described the scene. The minute hand touched 7.30. On the second, 900 guns of all calibres stopped by the 15-inch broadsides from the distant battleships lying off the beaches vomited their inferno. Concealed guns opened fire from fields, hedges and farms in every direction. 
During short pauses between salvos, more guns could be heard further away. It was like rolls of thunder, only it never slackened. Hurling itself onto strong points, enemy gun areas, forming up places, tank lagers, and above all concentrated into the creeping mass of shells that raked ahead of our own infantrymen as thousands of gunners bent to their task. The Scotsmen of the 44th Brigade began to advance through the tall grass and corn. The corn was up to their waist as they advanced down the Mew Valley towards the rifle slits manned by the SS Grenadiers. The left assaulting company of the 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers began to take casualties as shells began to fall short. Additionally, two of the supporting Churchill tanks were immobilised as they struck mines, mines which had likely been laid out by the Canadians during the previous fighting. The morning mist was supplemented by the dust and smoke of the exploding artillery shells. Maintaining direction became difficult, but the Scotsmen continued their advance. Being on the left flank of Operation Epsom, the brigade wasn't covered by advancing friendly forces on its left flank. Instead, German fire from the neighbouring sector began to pester the Lowland Brigade. Buchanan's 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers advanced towards the Muir Stream Valley, just north of their objective. It was behind this stream that the German defenders of the Erste Bataillon SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 26 had dug their outpost line. Brief firefights ensued between the Scots Fusiliers and the German Grenadiers, but by 8.30am the 6th Battalion Royal Scots Fusiliers had arrived at the gates of Saint-Monvieux. The Germans had converted the village into a daunting stronghold, with the stone farmhouses offering great protection to any defender. On the eastern edge of the village, SS Sturmbahnführer Krause had converted the Perron House as the headquarters for his battalion. The large stone residences and parkland was bustling with Hitler Youth Grenadiers running to and from the battle stations. With many walled manor houses and farm buildings, saint monvieux would prove to be very difficult to capture. The British bombardment was however able to destroy and knock out several of the Panzer Grenadier's heavy weapons. Mortars and anti-tank guns had to be abandoned as the Grenadiers retired towards the Perron House. Little by little, house by house, the Scots Fusiliers expanded their foothold in the north of saint monvieux Pockets of resistance were pushed back to the German command post in the southeast corner of the village. By 10.30am, the Perron house was in the Fusiliers' sights. Artillery shells crashed into the Perron park and the neighbouring houses and streets. The staff of the 1st Battalion 26th Panzer Grenadier Regiment was crammed into the cellar as runners came back with updates from the front line. News arrived that SS Obersturmführer Gröschel in command of the 2nd Company had been killed. The joint in between the 1st and 2nd Companies had been breached and British tanks were rumbling outside the German command post. Krause, in command of the battalion, promptly ordered to contact a neighbouring Panzer Company to set up a local counterattack. The command post at the Perron House became the location where the remnants of the battered companies rallied to reorganise and continue the fight. Among those concentrated at the Perron residence was SS Unterscharführer Emil Dürr of the Vierte Schwerer Compagnie. A German war correspondent who had arrived at Krause's command post was able to report the action in which Dürr was killed. Dürr's actions is one of the many acts of heroism carried out by both sides during the bitter fighting for saint monvieux as the 44th Lowland Brigade had finally broken through the perimeter defences and the supporting tanks had been brought forward to capture the command post of the 1st Battalion SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 26, heavy fighting broke out. The Panzer Grenadier were desperately fighting back the Churchill tanks and Scottish infantry from the walled Perron estate. One of the Churchill Crocodile flamethrowing tanks of the 141st Regiment Royal Armoured Corps arrived at the park's entrance and began spewing fire into the defending Germans. Georges Bernage, in Battle of the Odon, describes Dürr's prompt action after grabbing a Panzerfaust. It was difficult to get close to the tank as it was sitting in a position that dominated the terrain on all three sides. Dürr jumped across the inner wall of the yard and ran straight at the tank, but the Panzerfaust did not pierce the tank. It was at this stage that Dürr was shot in the chest. Bernage quotes the unknown German war correspondent to describe what happened next. Dürr picked up another Panzerfaust and ran up to the tank a second time. This time, he aimed at the tracks. The tank rattled, the track ripped, but again Dürr was covered by violent machine gun fire. Crawling, he worked his way back. He spotted a magnetic charge and quickly grabbed it. 
For the third time, now quite weakened, he jumped across the wall. He grabbed the charge with a strong fist, pressed it against the tank, staggered once, pushed, gasping against a diabolic dynamite. Everything exploded in fire and flames, and night fell before his eyes. Severely wounded, Dur crawled back to the Perron Park where he was collected by his comrades and brought to the first aid post where he succumbed to his wounds several hours later. The 24-year-old SS Unterschachführer Dur was to posthumously receive the prestigious Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross for his actions at saint mont -Vieux. He is buried at the German War Cemetery in Lacombe. The War Diary of the 141st Regiment tells its version of the fighting at saint mont -Vieux. Captain Strachan's two troops of flame-throwing Churchill tanks had been caught up to support the Scots Fusiliers in the clearing of saint mont -Vieux. The attack went well and house by house saint mont -Vieux was being cleared of German defenders. As they neared the Perron house, however, fighting was becoming increasingly difficult. There was only room for one tank to proceed to the courtyard of the walled estate. In trying to enter the gate, Lieutenant Harvey Churchill shed a track. In total, the two troops lost three of its tanks, two of them shedding a track and a third being overturned. Much has been speculated about the faith of Lieutenant Harvey's crew. Only one occupant of his tank was taken prisoner. The remaining four, including Harvey, were never seen again. It was later believed that all four were taken by the SS and shot. However, without solid sources, this account remains speculative. Meanwhile, south of the village, the 8th Royal Scots had advanced towards La Gaule. The positions were held by the 2nd Company SS Panzer Pionier Battalion 12. However, this company of engineers became surrounded and overwhelmed by the Churchill tanks of A Squadron 9th Royal Tank Regiment. It took the Scots two hours to clear the cornfields and reach the Confontenay Road. But, once the road had been reached, the Scotsmen made quick progress and captured La Gaule within the hour. The right flank of the 44th Brigade had inadvertently attacked the weak link between the 1st Battalion Panzergrenadier Regiment 26 and the 12th SS Pioneer Battalion. Back at saint mont -Vieux, the remnants of the 2nd and 4th Companies remained heavily entrenched around the battalion CP. At 5pm, the 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers finally reported that the northern edge of the village had been cleared. However, the day's fighting had proved very costly and the battalion was very stretched on manpower. At about 6 pm, a local counterattack struck the battalion's left flank as the Erste Compagnie SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 26, aided by an assault gun battery of the 21st Panzer Division, tried to break through to Krauser's command post. The attack was largely beaten off, apart from a small penetration in the orchard north of the village. Later on, another counterattack was seen to develop on the right flank of the battalion, prompting Lieutenant Colonel Buchanan to request reinforcements in the form of the 6th King's Own Scottish Borderers. The Brigadier, in view of the heavy losses incurred by the Scots Fusiliers, decided to engage the entirety of the King's Own Scottish Borders, with the exception of a rifle company which was kept in reserve. The 6th King's Own Scottish Borders subsequently relieved the battered 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers inside saint mont -Vieux. Lieutenant Wilcombe would later recall entering the village. A number of dulled men in steel helmets wearing anti-gas capes against a rain were discovered in a captured German position. Scots Fusiliers, 28 of them, all that was left of a company that had crossed the starting line that morning. The company commander was dead, and a tired captain with handlebar moustaches was in command. He had been reduced to a state of fatalism and recited to me their losses in a strain of mournful satisfaction. The relief proved difficult to execute as small local counterattacks kept harassing the line. Eventually, at 11pm, the final elements of the 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers had withdrawn. At the same time, however, the 129th Infantry Brigade of the 43rd Wessex Division was also making preparations to take over the line at saint mont -Vieux. While the British were relieving the line all along saint mont -Vieux, at the German command post, SS Sturmbannführer Bernhard Krause gave the order to withdraw. His largely encircled 2nd and 4th companies were to break out and join friendly lines at Marcellet. Nevertheless, he ordered his 1st and 3rd companies, which were still holding the line north and east of saint mont outside the British operational area to remain in place. SS Unterschachführer Heinrich Bassenauer described the withdrawal. After darkness we assembled for the breakout. In the lead, Papa Krause, a huge figure and a shining fatherly example, followed by the rest of his battalion, including our own wounded and prisoners. 
Unnoticed, we slipped through the English, in a tall grain field, crossed the Camp Fontenay Road, and reached the Marcellet Versant Road, where we were welcomed by our own units. By the end of the first day of Operation Epsom, the left flank of the 15th Scottish Division and particularly the 44th Lowland Brigade had succeeded in taking saint monvieux and La Gaulle. Nevertheless, the capture of both villages had been costly. The staunch resistance offered by the defending Panzer Grenadiers of the SS Hitler Jugend at saint monvieux was to greatly resemble the remainder of Operation Epsom, in which a numerically inferior defending force managed to contain the revolving British attacks in their attempts to clear the Odon bridges and capture the ground south of Caen to envelop the city. The 6th Battalion Royal Scots Fusiliers suffered 21 men killed, 113 wounded and 9 missing. The 8th Royal Scots had 16 men killed, 92 wounded, of which 3 officers and 2 missing. The log of the 12th Hitler Jugend Division records that Kauser's 1st Battalion had 6 men killed, 23 wounded and 40 missing for 26 June 1944. These numbers could be higher depending on when information of casualties arrived at the rear. The division's pioneer battalion suffered greater losses. They suffered 18 killed, 23 wounded and 280 missing. Note, however, that not all casualties occurred in front of La Gaulle and saint monvieux If you want to know more about the British dead, I would highly recommend you to look at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission's handy Find War Dead tool to search for First and Second World War Graves. In this video, I have mainly covered the action of the Royal Scots Fusiliers on 26 June 1944. By entering these variables in the database, you immediately get a list of names of soldiers of the regiment who died that day. You can sort them in the way that suits you, and you can easily see in which cemetery they are buried. If you click on a given soldier, you can find additional information as well as original documents from the CWGC's online archive. This brings me to the end of this video. I hope you have enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you did, and I hope to catch you in another video. If you want to see more videos like this one, why not click on one of my suggestions? Cheers!